So from time to time, I have people reach out to me because they are interested in the field of nutrition or natural medicine or health coaching, and they want to know where to start or what schools to go to or, or what to study. And so that's what this video is about. And what I want to start with is that to get to that point, most people I have found have gone through something they've reached a point where they now have a desire to serve others. They've been through some sort of transformational process. They've had their own healing. They've worked through relationship issues. They've gone through something and now they're wanting to share it with others. And I think that is a beautiful thing, right? Of course, that's an amazing thing. That's probably what we're really here for, I believe, is that we're here to struggle through something in the world. And then we end up with a gift that is spiritual which represents uh, an act of transcending the world, right? So, and that is where we start to have our connection to God. God elevates us out of the world. And so healing and all the struggles that we go through actually bring us closer to God. And then we feel a natural urge to give that back. What I want to remind you is that the heart of a healer is in the mindset and not the occupation. You can take that feeling of giving and apply it to nearly anything you do. That is the truth. Not every holistic doctor is a healer. There's many technicians out there, and that's fine. But that's different than a passionate craving based on the need to serve other people. That heart can be something that you apply wherever you're at whether you're in finances, whether you're in real estate, whether you own a mechanic shop, operating from principle and integrity and being present with others always is something that elevates the situation to something that is transcendent and healing for all involved. Do what you do with integrity, principle, and genuine service to others, and that will be your ministry. I really feel strongly that that is what happens with any pursuit. But nonetheless, it might be that you have an interest in the healing arts or in learning more about nutrition or something like that. So we unfortunately live in a society that portrays the outcome without the journey. So I owned a gym for 20 years. I started when I was 18 as an athletic trainer and then worked for the YMCA and then um, eventually opened up my own gym. And it's very easy to see something like a fit trainer and think, oh, I want to have that lifestyle without knowing that there was a whole lot of work that went into it or that the personal trainers getting up at five in the morning and they're not working with fitness athletes. What they're working with is regular middle-aged people who are depressed and overweight and the trainer becomes somebody who's really putting all kinds of motivation into them to help get them through the mud of a sedentary life to where they're back in action and in shape. And it takes a tremendous amount of, of effort. And it's not exciting. It's exciting when you see the long-term process. But without that vision and understanding, the personal trainer who's excited about the vision of fitness and owning the gym for 20 years, I had all kinds of trainers who would want to do exercises that were based on high level fitness. It was mainly their entertainment. And I would have to stop them and say, this is not what your clients can even handle at this point. This is for you, but you have to meet them where they're at. And so that gap would start to close in. And if you can pursue the reality of it and make that leap, then you go through what could be long hours, odd hours, burnout, and end up as a superstar trainer, the way so many trainers do end up. But same thing can happen with healthcare or holistic care. There can be these visions of how we're going to end up, but there's a huge gap of what it takes to get there and that vision of being some sort of health coach. Yeah, it's a long journey, no doubt. Uh, I started personal training when I was 18. I've always wanted to do what I do now. It took me a long time all throughout my 20s to get to where I could do what I do now and then lots of degrees, lots of changing direction, 
uh, here I am, I'm 50 and I have two masters and two doctorates and yeah, I'm at the other end of that, but it was a very long journey. Uh, building my practice has been many, many long years in the making with hundreds of thousands spent on schooling, seminars, books, certifications, equipment, supplies, not to mention so many different mistakes. You buy a $5,000 piece of equipment that you don't use. There's a few of those circumstances I've been through. Um, that's what it takes to get into the field. So I just want to caution, you know, to think through it and look at what it is that you're desiring. And if you're desiring service to others, I really do believe that's a mindset. Um, don't be a hippie. Now, I know hippie is a term that probably has some good qualities and refers to hipster, but I came up with my own definition. And that's the definition I'm working with here. It's a person who fantasizes about an ideal while being irresponsible to the practical behaviors related to it. Be somebody who says, oh, I love my kids, but they don't show up. Somebody who says, oh, I want to be, a, you know, a um, famous YouTuber and they don't make videos or they want to play piano and be a concert pianist, but they don't really sit and practice when they feel uncomfortable. I any version of this could be what I would call a hippie. And if you're going to get into a field and you have that idea and that vision, make sure that it's real enough and fueling you enough to get you through the trenches of real life because that's what you're going to have to do to get there. I would always hear my wife Kelly saying, oh, he loves school because I've been in school for over 16 years in graduate schools one way or the other uh, after high school, bachelors, two masters, two doctorates. And so, oh, he just loves school. Well, that's not true at all. I had a vision and then I had to pay the price and I had to change it as I went until I finally arrived at where I have been for quite some time. And so you could very, very clearly say that Cassoni Wellness, which is a smashing success with a team of four doctors now and skincare staff and a full-time pharmacy tech, and we've, we're well established. We're probably the big fish in holistic care from San Diego to LA. And that's probably a very fair statement, but it's been 30 plus years in the making. Absolutely. It did not come easily. And it, so anyways, I want to remind you of that. Don't quit your day job. If you're following a passion, I hear the hippie mentality, not to pick on you. We all have that mentality where, well, I want to do my passion. So now it's below me to work for a buck or something like that. That's the hippie. You still got to do reality. And so, um, if a better uh, version of that might be something that is a segue field while you're working on something bigger. A segue field would be like personal training was for me. I always wanted to get into natural medicine. Uh, at 18 years old, I lived in Seattle and I would go to Bastyr College and I was just like, this is what I want to do at 18 years old. And I had that vision before being 18 years old. But at that time, I would go there routinely. And it's like, this is where I want to go. I didn't go there. But the concept was always naturopathic medicine, natural medicine, holistic medicine. So, um, you know, on the way there, you can do something that's in the field of health. Personal training became that for me. But there's massage, there's, there's a number of other things. Uh, Let's say you get into yoga instruction or something where you're cultivating lifestyle and um, health and a healthy mindset while you're learning pieces of that deeper puzzle in school. <clears throat> I think that might be fair to say, but to just go, oh, I've got to have my passion, so I'm going to drop out of my responsibilities to get there. I think that's not uh, very functional. I think that can get us into a lot of trouble if we do that. Okay, but if you really want healthcare for a career, there are two fundamental categories. Um, let's get into these categories here. So we have unlicensed and licensed, right? So before I go further, I want to discuss medical doctor license, which includes the DO or doctor of osteopathy license. These are of no interest. This is not holistic care licenses. The doctors who are stuck as an MD who invested heavily because the cost of stress and effort to get through that very rigorous schooling only to find that they are handcuffed by a very, very um, strict uh, 
liability within the field, right? So we want to have a greater scope, a lot that we can do, but we don't want to have so many areas that we can get in trouble. Of course, this is not discussing gross negligence. There should always be accountability for gross negligence in any field. But if you look at like the medical doctor license, they can't even discuss vaccines in California or they can lose their license. So your next door neighbor has more freedom than a medical doctor. And that's very sad. So being a medical doctor to go then backwards so that you can use nutrition, which is outside of standard of care, where you end up having to run thousands of dollars for each patient worth of labs just to justify what you're giving them is not the best route. I have met doctors, medical doctors who've given up their license, so they just don't have to do that. But that's that's rare. You'd almost have to be privately wealthy to have survived all of that money in student loans and schooling to be able to walk away from it so that you can treat people with herbs and, and nutrition and stuff like I do. So that's not a great choice. The training is fantastic when it comes to all the things that I don't do. I don't do emergent care. I don't do surgeries. I don't do labor delivery, all kinds of things that MDs that we refer out to. So that's fantastic, but that's not really holistic care. That's not really paying attention to causative factors and functional holistic care models where you really hone in on the physiology. They don't have time for that. So if, uh, if you want to be an MD, good, bad news is it's a uh, rigid standard of care. We have a pressure with the MDs to have one size fits all care models. There's no patient centered care anymore. But uh, the, and the bad news is that most of the MDs are dissatisfied. There's a very high level of dissatisfaction within the field. Um, the money is not there the way it used to be to justify all that they have to go through. So a lot of them find that they have to specialize. So if you stick with it and you go specialized, then you can make a great income and probably in the specialties, maybe you start to have some reasonable, um, you know, purpose that's not just stuck in the machine of the modern day conventional care model. But, um, and I'm not criticizing medical doctors in general. Like I said, we refer out all the time. We look for red flags and it's like, hey, this is a red flag. You have to go to the MD. We don't have those advanced diagnostic uh, uh, equipment, right? So we don't have MRIs. We don't have, so we say, hey, you have to look at this. We don't do that, but they don't do what we do. And this conversation is about holistic care models. Now, the doctor of osteopathy, they do study more holistic care models within their training with the same status as MD. However, the pressure to follow the rigid standards of care, it doesn't really allow them to end up doing the osteopathic medicine. They don't have time for it. And so in the U.S., especially the doctors of osteopathic medicine end up practicing pretty much exactly the same as a medical doctor. So it just depends on what you want to do. You want to go do surgeries. You want to go do th those things. You have to be an MD. Um, okay, so back to our health careers. There are. There's another. We could also mention doctor of physical therapy. That's not really looking at uh, other pathologies. That's really focused on advanced understandings of the musculoskeletal system, traumas, and uh, all, it's a it's a brilliant study. If that's what you're drawn to. That's not going to be so much holistic. That's really one focused study on the musculoskeletal and possibly nervous system and how to repair it. And they do some amazing things. Um, it's worth noting that there is something called degree creep. So when I'm looking at these professions coming up, what is the first degree that allows you the license? So for physical therapy, it used to be a bachelor's degree. And then you could get your license, then it became a master's, then it became a doctor. So now anybody going into physical therapy, you have to be a doctor of physical therapy. Fantastic career choice if that's what you want, but you're not looking at, uh, you know, causation of uh, chronic acne, eczema, autoimmune diseases, and uh, menstrual cycle irregularities like we do. So, um, okay, so going back into the licensed and, and unlicensed, um, the real question is, do you want to practice medicine? If you want to practice medicine, you need a license. It is illegal to practice medicine without a license. And what that means is if you want to get into health coaching or nutritionist or something, but you're wanting to discuss pathology, you're wanting to look through labs and understand them, you're wanting to discuss 
treatment based on a diagnosis, even if it's functional, with a treatment strategy, then that is called medicine. And you can't do that without a license. I may disagree with that because the models that we're using are low risk models. So they should not have such a heavy uh, legal limitation to it, but that's where it's at. And the penalties can be jail time and very steep fines. Good example of this, a great story is a close friend of mine who had her bachelor's in nursing and was a licensed nurse and very talented. She had gotten a naturopathic doctor degree and she had opened up a practice and was basically treating people with clinical nutrition and herbs and, and different things. And she was very talented and there was no problem and her patients loved her and everything was great. The At that time in California, there was no license for the naturopathic doctor title, which meant that she could use that title because she had an academic doctorate. Remember, there's academic and then there's the license, but there was no license. Well, once the license showed up, at that point, once there's a license, now you're required for the naturopathic doctor license to have the exact schooling requirements and the testing and everything else. She was not grandfathered in. They don't do that. And so she kept practicing. And the board for naturopathic medicine in California uh, went after her for $80,000 in one year in jail. Now, this is outrageous. This is outrageous. Can you imagine that? You're just helping people with nutrition and, and lifestyle and they go after you for jail time. Now, she was able to fight it in court. It was one of the most stressful battles of her life. And she got it down to, I think, $15,000 with no jail time. That's still outrageous because we know she really didn't do anything wrong. Furthermore, when we look into the case, it wasn't that she was um, being pursued for practicing medicine without a license. It was actually another naturopathic doctor who had the license. And what they were going after her for was practicing in a field without the license, which took money from the field. It was taking revenue that should be going to the licensed practitioners. The whole thing was so bizarre and self-centered and egotistical on the you know, board side that it's just, it's just amazing. But nonetheless, that's what happens out there. So who reports you is the other doctors who are not busy, right? So that's just the reality of it. So if you want to practice medicine, you need to look at the licensed fields and we're going to cover those. Now, if you don't want to have a license, there is a lot of wiggle room, right? This is the health coach, the nutritionist, author, speaker, social media presence, personal trainer, yoga instructor. We could probably add so many more to this list, uh, energy worker. I don't know. You could, you could do a whole bunch of things in here and then add your flavoring that is making an impact with people without being a diagnostician, right? There are huge... Uh, success stories on YouTube and people are just talking about a single diet. They're making recipes. They're changing lives. They're clearly changing lives. And none of that is with a license. None of that needs any liability issues or anything like that. They're picking up more of an educator role. And if that appeals to you, that would be the easiest one. And you're just going to have to be innovative and your your passion is there and you go forward and you build something. Or you combine it with your personal training or whatever you're doing, you, you start deepening what you can teach people about what they're doing. But you can't diagnose and you can't talk about adrenal and thyroid and endocrine function and then say, here's what we're going to do to adjust it and then we're going to follow up. That's medicine and you're it's getting dicey there. So unlicensed is very appealing. You can make up something. Let's say you make up, uh, you know, here's your eight weeks to health program. And for the eight weeks, you're teaching some mindset, some meditation, some stretches, dietary changes, and then week two, week three, you could make up something and you would be serving people with your passion and being creative and you get it up and running. And with social media nowadays, you could be a great success. So there's a lot of room for this unlicensed category. And the question would be, do you need school for this category? And that's where I feel that there's a lot of sham programs showing up where you don't really need it. You don't need an academic program. Academic learning is 
really a deep dive. It teaches you how to be uh, ultimately, if you go for a doctorate, you're going to have some research skills. You're going to be able to teach. I'm a professor. I teach clinical nutrition in a master's program. So I have a lot to say about this. Um, on the credible side, if you want to go into that with the professional license, that's what you're going to do. But if you're really just being somebody who's passionate about health and you want to have a voice and you want to write a book, you don't need those things. And so I think that um, you don't need an academic program. Instead, you might find either no program where you're just learning on your own, right? And you're, you're following other leaders and making your own version and having your own experience. You have a, your own weight loss journey and you can share that, right? Uh, something like that. Or, or you know, you healed out of autoimmune and you're sharing that and that becomes something that is something. That becomes something that makes a difference in other people's lives. Uh, so this is, this is something to consider that if you're in this category, you could pick programs that might be more enjoyable. So a non-academic program is not going to have a degree. But it could still be like, hey, we're going to teach nutrition or we're going to teach something. And um, I think there's a lot of sham schools like that. Like, do you need that? You can learn a lot of that on your own. But maybe you go because it's going to bring together like-minded people. And if you're fortunate, you might find a program that's going to be very good. They're going to teach you some things. Um, but where are we going with this? Remember, if they teach you things that end up being slightly medical you can't use that so you're you're it's like how are they teaching you um you know so just pay attention to that knowing that the goal is to be educational you're an educator the goal is to get to where you're learning how to uh talk about some of the things that anybody could use that do not need uh differentiation based on functional assessment and in nutrition science is huge. I've studied all parts of this, but it's worth noting that if we get into nutrition, and a lot of this is the academic side, you can study it anthropologically, right? That's like histories of different societies and cultures and what dietary influences created different disease patterns at different times. Um, even epidemiology could mix into that, which is public health patterns. Um, based on food consumption or um, or even influences from uh, bad food or parasites or contaminated food, which then goes into practices to make food safety, which used to be fermentation and cured foods. And all of that's nutrition, basically. Um, biochemistry, uh, I've studied a lot of biochemistry. That's how we're able to think through some of the products we use, it's good to know that. That's my least favorite study, by the way, because it's just so technical. Uh, research, of course, tabloid nutrition, I don't like that, but that shows up. It's like writing kind of like sensational articles about, you know, whatever, the next new thing, turmeric being like the next new thing. So those are short-sighted, but that shows up. Nutrition as medicine, I like that. Dietitian, not so much. Dietitians, unfortunately, end up studying um, like cafeteria menus, hospital menus, because they're having to fit, um, you know, dietary guidelines in with budgets. And so that's not really going to be food as a healing source, but more like uh, you can get a job somewhere and it's, it's a little bit different, but you would think dietitian might have more clinical nutrition, but it ends up not really being that way. Functional medicine is just a term that is really shouldn't even be a popular term uh, because it's like looking at the function of the body and trying to get back to normal function. That should be somewhere in conventional care. It's just not. So that means that when you look at causative factors, it becomes its own thing. So that's where it's at. But nonetheless, because it involves nutrition as a form of repairing normal function, that's in the study of, of nutrition. So nutrigenomics or <clears throat> how we're influenced by our genetics, that's something that's emergent. And I think some of those 
are uh, end up being sales pitches. We have all these companies selling labs. Here's all the labs you should run with your patients, and that justifies the product. And it, that's short-sighted. I, I really I see a lot of doctors doing that where they're not understanding the physiology. So many of the biomarkers that I uncover in an intake, really important clues, signs, and symptoms are not even going to show up in a lab, yet they're they're crucial to telling us where we're at within a case, what's working, what's not, uh, based on ultimately getting them to their chief complaint. So there's no way around it. You have to know physiology and pathophysiology if you're going to be in uh, medicine. So, um, okay, so terms for the field, holistic, natural, integrative, functional, these are non-licensed terms. They don't mean anything. You see somebody says integrative medicine, functional medicine, natural medicine, holistic. I picked holistic because it's just what people connect to. But what is my background, right? I'm licensed. I, I have training in clinical nutrition. I have clean training in plant medicine and training in um, Western medicine, conventional medicine, and also in acupuncture, right? But uh, you could you could see somebody who's a holistic doctor and they don't do any of that. They just do uh, prayer with you or, or energy work or something like that. Um, I will add homeopathic medicine here. Uh, people confuse that with some sort of natural medicine umbrella, but it's not. Homeopathic medicine is a very specific style of medicine where highly dilute doses of poisons, basically. It's almost like making a dilution of an irritant and then giving it to the body to trigger a response. That That is what it is. So some people will think homeopathy, oh, that's herbs and nutrition and stuff. No, that's a very specific form of using those dilutions to trigger a response in the body. It is what it is. It may or may not be effective. It's highly controversial because some of the dilutions are just too dilute to make sense. But the fact that it still works so often, it's worth investigation. Uh, there is no license for homeopathic medicine, but it's a very dicey midline because you're, you're practicing medicine. The understanding of homeopathic medicine, the literature, it was founded by a medical doctor. It was promoted by medical doctors. The vast amount of books and textbooks on that medicine are by medical doctors. So if you pursued that, you might want to pursue that while having a license that you can practice it under. This would not really be for the unlicensed person. Okay, so I want to focus on chiropractic, acupuncture, and naturopathy. Those are the licenses that I want to focus on. And of course, this will change per state. And I mentioned the first degree entry. That can change. What they're studying can change per state. So you have to look up what state you're going to want to practice in and really think through it from there. Remember what we want. We want to be able to do more and be left alone because these fields do have low risk. Uh, if we're cutting into people, you shouldn't be uh, without regulation. Uh, or, or if you're giving drugs, all the drugs have side effects and harm people. We are topping our deaths. The, the cause of death in this country is way up there. It's like heart disease and cancers and then drug interactions. So that's even from licensed medical doctors getting it wrong. Overprescribing is a real problem right now. So we don't have that. Nobody's dying of acupuncture. Nobody's dying of, of, of these things. You can have a, a abnormal or horrendous single situation that can happen in any field. But for the most part, and, and you can tell this by the liability um, insurance for a surgeon. It's many thousands sometimes, even a month can be. But for an acupuncturist, it might be a few hundred bucks a year, right? So uh, it's apple orange. It's just we're not hurting people. Yeah, we can only get you more. We can only get you more better, right? So we can only we can miss it, and we're not getting you better, but we didn't harm you. So the liability in these fields are if you don't refer out for a presentation that may have a narrowing window of treatment opportunity, and that is a legitimate um, uh, liability. And I think that's a problem. I think a lot of people in these fields feel that they're not wanting to refer out. I, I think that's a mistake. We refer out for red flags. Better be to be safe than sorry. If, I, if somebody has chest pain, I'm going to refer out. It may be something that we can treat, but we got to make sure that there's not something uh, more serious going on that we don't have the equipment to check for. 
Okay, so we want the greatest scope of practice with the least liability is a good way to say it. So let's start with the naturopathic medicine. So naturopathic medicine was my first um, focus when I was a teenager, and I thought that's what I wanted, but I was in Washington State. And Washington State has a very strong license for the naturopathic doctor license. And certainly if you're in Washington or Oregon or Arizona, that might actually be a great choice because their status is very high. They're sitting on all the medical boards, rubbing elbows with the MDs and making decisions about legislation. That's their that's their status level. That's fantastic. They have a strong biomedical background. Biomedicine means Western medicine. We're learning all the basics, your anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, uh, physical examination, everything that is what we think of as Western medicine, even pharmacology, all of that's taught. And that's going to be the same for acupuncture and chiropractic as well. These are all fields that are required, depending on what state you're in, coming from California, that was very steep. They have highest standards, the highest in the nation um, for acupuncture and not so much for a naturopath. And then uh, Florida also, also, I believe, has similarly high standards for acupuncture. So you go to other states and acupuncture might not even be regulated. It's just like anybody could do it, we don't, we don't care. So, but nonetheless, um, the route that I took and what I looked at, naturopathic medicine really shines in Washington, Oregon, and Arizona. And the schools are, very comprehensive. It's You're going to need a four-year degree to get into these schools, and it's going to be four years plus internships, etc. And it's going to be a small fortune. This is a very expensive degree. Now, there are some good things and bad things about this. Let's look at this. So they're going to study herbs. So strong biomedicine, and then the other side of it, we have some herbs, we have nutrition, we have homeopathy, and then we have just tons of stuff, hydrotherapy, psychotherapy, chiropractic, physical therapy, acupuncture, midwifery, and more. They study so much, and that is an amazing thing. That's why I liked it in the beginning. However, the problem is, you know, as I met many naturopathic doctors uh, throughout my career, uh, most of them don't use all that. It's just too much. It's like each one of those fields like you could chiropractic is in there acupuncture you could you could spend a whole part of your training just on acupuncture yet they take a little bit of it so they they end up being a master of none that's what i've seen and so what a naturopathic doctor does is typically they get out of school and they end up picking one or two of those and then they have to relearn it in a deeper level because their school didn't cover it and so that's fine that's but it is what it is. And so if you're in California, this is Bastier opened up in California. I, I'm not sure they're fully up to scale the way Bastier in Washington is. I'm not so sure they're even doing acupuncture yet. But nonetheless, it's worth looking into making an appointment with a counselor. It is uh, costly. I, I, I don't like this anymore because of uh, where it's at with the rest of the states. But depending on where you're at, it might be the choice for you. Um, okay. Chiropractic medicine, of course, strong biomedical background. Chiropractic medicine uh, started as a sham. And I hope I don't offend any of my chiropractic friends for saying that. I think all of them would agree with it. So what, what it happened was there was an experience and that experience had to do with an adjustment. And then it's like, that means something. Well, that was legit, but it became a uh, mail order certification. So it, in its inception, it became like a let's make money and train people through mail order certifications to become chiropractors. And, and if I'm wrong, I can be corrected. That's fine. But that's OK. That was the starting point. What went on is that it became so popular because so many people felt better that at some point uh, the popularity created a rigor of study and they found out that there was some legit things about it. Now, what makes it a sham also is because the original thoughts were that all disease was from some subluxation in the spine. So that that's not accurate. It, it can absolutely profoundly affect so many things throughout the whole body, not just pain in the back. It, it can for sure. But we wouldn't want to say everything explains that. Almost like this is the only tool you need. You know, no, that's not the case. I, I have acupuncture; it's an amazing tool. But some cases, it's like acupuncture is not going to help. Uh, and same with 
every medical model. So, but what it turned into is a very solid medical model over the decades. And what you see nowadays is that chiropractors have very strong Western medical background. They're highly trained. Um, you typically need a four year degree to get into school. And so you're going to have strong Western sciences. Uh, they're, you know, pretty strict on what they're allowing you to take to even get into the school. Um, so I feel very confident about this field. I like this one a lot for people looking at holistic medicine because they did so well with the license in certain states. Like uh, in California, they, they have a very solid license. It can't be messed with. Um, none of the licenses are at threat right now, but medicine models have been taken down. And uh, that's something to think about. Well, the chiropractic, you know, boards really got together and they made some strength behind their license. And so they really get left alone. They became a little bit um, greedy. They, meaning the average chiropractor during the 80s and 90s. And there were a lot of these like, you know, insurance mills where they're just billing for everything's a soft tissue injury and they racked up a fortune, these practices. Um, and so I have a feeling because of that, insurance came down on them and started restricting them. And that's unfortunate that that was abused. But um, the, medic, the medical model of chiropractic is fantastic. Okay, so they, they take musculoskeletal, of course, in addition to all their biomedicine, they're going to focus on musculoskeletal. Notice how the study is now getting bigger than the naturopathic doctor. And then they're going to study physical therapy, of course. I mean, you have a skilled chiropractor and they can be an, an excellent uh, sports medicine doctor, physical therapist. They study all those things and can refine it after their degree to have even more skill set. Now, they're also going to study some nutrition and lifestyle, but it's not huge. Um, now saying that some of the best nutritionists I've met have been chiropractors. It just, you, there's remember there's, once you get your degree and your background and what you can do after that, you're still going to keep studying and picking fields that you want to do, but this would be a very, very solid license to operate under. So, um, that's kind of what that looks like. Okay. So East Asian medicine, once again, we have our strong biomedical background, just like the chiropractor and just like the naturopathic doctor that's required and that's required in California. Both, uh, all three of these licenses are considered primary care practices. So this is a primary care status. So, so acupuncture is a primary care status in, in California. So there's going to be a lot of study on plant medicines as the other side of the picture here, biomedicine, a lot of study. So far more than any of the others, lots, you're just drilled in on herbs. You want to know them up and down and there's hundreds of herbs and then there's hundreds of formulas and you have to know them the state board requires a, a complete knowledge of all of these. Uh, of course, you're going to study acupuncture. And we're talking about a five-year master's program. That's a very big bloated master's program. No master's program is that big, but that's that's what's happened. In their degree creep, they're they're getting close to where it's going to be like the physical therapy, a doctoral degree. So it'll be a doctor of acupuncture, something like that. Hasn't happened yet. So right now you could get into acupuncture. You could take a two-year degree, which allows you access to the master's program. And then upon completing the master's program, you can get the license. Uh, going back for the three and a half years more of the doctoral work that I did in the BAOM program, that's a acupuncture and herbal medicine doctorate. Um, that's above and beyond. That is not what's needed for the license. That's just me and my colleagues and our love of the field that we go back and do that if that's what you we, somebody chooses to do. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, nutrition, lifestyle, that's in there too. That's fantastic. I just, I love this one um, because I felt like I was going to have a model that I really cared about. I'm mostly into herbs and acupuncture uh, and clinical nutrition anyways, right? So that's me, herbs. So this is a thought through this, uh, these three top categories that I would refer you to. And I might even add this. Um, so I favor acupuncture and chiropractic. There are a few schools. Now I teach at South Baylor University. It's a fantastic school. I attended Pacific College of Health Sciences in San Diego also. There's some, so many great stools, schools, stools. There's a lot of great stools too, if you're a regular, but um, 
the uh, option of getting a dual chiropractic acupuncture license is also available at some of the schools if you look through that. Now that would require a higher price tag and more studying, but that could almost be like the creme de la creme uh, way to end up if you're gonna go into this. Um, so, so many options. I hope this was useful and helpful and let me know if you have any questions. All right, take care, bye.